Hi. I was going to say I'm here standing in for Steve, but <laughs> it's a real pleasure to introduce Leah Gerber to you. Uh, Leah, I think many of you have met Leah already, but if you haven't, she kind of practices what we preach here in the Bren School. She actually has spent her career uh, both working as a, a research ecologist, but also very much coupling her research to the management of wild populations. A lot of emphasis on uh, marine mammals, sea lions and whales. We'll hear about that today. Just a bit on her background. She got her bachelor's from Mills College and then went to the University of Washington in Seattle where she got a master's in marine affairs, is that right? And then a PhD um, from the, that distinguished university. We first met, I think, when you were a postdoctoral fellow at NCS. Uh, since then, she's gone on to become an assistant and then associate professor at Arizona State in Tempe. She's just finished another NCS uh, stint as a uh, visiting sabbatical fellow. She has a remarkably long and interesting publication record, much of it concerned with sort of looking at wild populations and how disease and management practices and behavior influence population dynamics in wild populations like sea lions, in terms of things like trying to put science into practice, among other things, she spent a lot of time on recovery teams. She spent many years on the white abalone recovery team, for example. And I believe you're the editor for Conservation Letters as well at this point. So anyway, she's busy, she's very productive, and she's having a lot of influence in this uh, kind of science-guided policy world of conservation biology and conservation planning. Without any further ado, it's a great pleasure to have you here. You're with us for the year visiting, so you can tell us where your office is or don't if you don't want us to know where to find you. But her talk today, you see the title here, and uh, thank you for doing this. Is this working? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Frank. Is that decibel level okay? Okay. Um, for your kind introduction, and thank you all for coming today. Um, I'm really delighted to be here at the Bren School this year, um, and I look forward to interactions with many of you. My office is on the fourth floor, uh, 4420, so please do stop by. What I want to talk to you about today is the global management of whales. Uh, in particular, my role as a scientific advisor to the International Whaling Commission, and more generally, uh, I'd like to talk about the use of science in the decision-making process under the IWC. So let's see if I could make this work here. Okay. Uh, the heart of the, the debate about the global management of whales is largely ideological. Let's see, is this a pointer? Yes, good. Okay. Um, on one side, there's the perception that whales are unique creatures that uh, we, we should not harvest under any circumstances. Uh, the other perception, at the other side of the spectrum, is the perception that whales are a commodity like any other uh, resource that we exploit. So why should we give them um, special preference in how we manage resources? As you may imagine, um, little science enters this process, and the question of whether it's right or wrong to harvest whales is not a scientific question. So when we get into the actual management uh, decision-making um, arena, uh, it, little science gets into that. So what I would like to propose, and, and some of the things that I want to talk to you about today, um, is the potential application of some of the very simple tools from the field of quantitative conservation biology. Um, in particular, I'd like to highlight two approaches. One is what I refer to as the bread and butter of conservation biology, matrix population models. And in particular, uh, where most, the most common application is single sex, single patch models. But by adding a little bit more complexity in making these models um, uh, a two-site or potentially a two-sex model, um, we can explore more ideas about spatial heterogeneity, which is uh, an important issue in, in whale conservation. Second, marine ecosystem management and uh, marine ecosystem models 
have been a very popular approach uh, in the NGO community. Um, but my question is, to what extent can these models be used to guide real-world management? So throughout my talk, I'm going to be uh, relying on some of these, these modeling tools to answer fundamental questions about the global management of whales. Okay. Which thing? Okay, so the theme, the main theme of my talk is how do science and policy intersect in the global management of whales? A preview for what I'm going to talk about. First, I'm going to give you a sense for the policy setting of the International Whaling Commission. Um, and then I'm going to ta talk about two of the key management issues that are, are um, at the forefront of the global management of whales. So these are really important um, decisions that are being debated regularly at the annual IWC meetings. IWC meaning International Whaling Commission. So I'll talk about these um, problems and the potential application of um, these modeling tools. And then I'd like to conclude with what are the general lessons we've learned from this um, this case study, and to what extent can, can science uh, inform the decision process in international policy settings? Okay, so let's start with the International Whaling Commission and many of the nuances associated with the, this legislation. Uh, it, it's quite interesting to keep in mind that uh, international law is only binding if a nation chooses to participate. So the IWC is actually a voluntary organization, and if a particular country doesn't like what's being proposed, they could either leave the IWC or formally object to that particular um, uh, policy issue. Um, and, and furthermore, there's no ability to enforce anything. So. Um, uh, it's uh, potentially a little discouraging from the get-go. Um, why was the International Whaling Convention established and what's sort of the history of this legislation? Um, this is a brief tour of the International Whaling Commission. Uh, the uh, convention, and this is just some of the lingo that's used in IWC speak, the convention was established in 1946 um, essentially due to concern about extreme overexploitation about, uh, of whales on a global scale. Uh, the convention established a commission which was made up of, or is currently made up of 58 voluntary members with the secretariat in Cambridge. The IWC meets regularly, uh, annually, in different parts of the world. Um, to make decisions about the regulations of whales. The, this is a, an ex, these are some examples of the decisions that are made. Um, the regulations require a 75% majority needed to change what's referred to as the schedule. So you have to learn all this language before you uh, talk to IWC people. Um, and so that's really important to keep in mind given the heated debate between um, whether, whether whales are something that we should be harvesting or absolutely under no circumstances should we um, kill. <clears throat> no, nope, wrong way. Okay, so one of the things that I want to talk about and that has quite significant bearing on the future of whales is the use of sanctuaries, global sanctuaries. Under the convention, uh, the commission is authorized to establish sanctuary areas. And under the regulations or the schedule, sanctuaries are required to be reviewed every decade to determine um, whether the sanctuaries are meeting their management objectives. Currently, there are two sanctuary, whale, global whale sanctuaries in place. Uh, the first one, was established in the Indian Ocean, um, and the second one was established in the Southern Ocean. There are two additional sanctuaries in the South Pacific and South Atlantic that are at the proposal stage. But the, the thing I want to emphasize, or I guess point out with this slide, is this 
The Southern Ocean is a really important area for whales because many Southern, whale, uh, southern Hemisphere whales migrate to this area to feed in um, their breeding season. So it's a really critical area for a lot of species of, of whales. Okay, so I want to give you a sense for the status of whale populations in the, in the Southern Ocean. <clears throat> and what I'm showing here is the pre-whaling uh, population estimates for uh, several species of, of baleen whales and the latest population estimates. So what you see is that the, all of these populations are a small fraction of what they were historically. Um, and I think what is potentially more remarkable is that the, number, the cumulative number of whales killed for each of these species is larger than the historical abundance. So we've, we've taken out a lot of whales in this area. Okay. So continuing to navigate the IWC and sort of uh, getting a sense for this management framework. Another important aspect of the International Whaling Commission is what's known as the comprehensive assessment. And this is what is established the current moratorium. So currently there's a global moratorium on commercial whaling, meaning no one can take whales. Um, and the idea of the comprehensive assessment was to uh, pause whaling, get a handle on the situation, and try to figure out what is the population size, trends, risk factors, so that we can make rational decisions. It was intended to be a temporary measure so that whaling could resume at some point in the future. And one of the key developments associated with a comprehensive assessment is the uh, revised management plan and the revised management scheme, which is essentially a, a science-based harvest framework. Um, and this is intended to replace the current moratorium on commercial whaling. Okay, but it's important to keep in mind that the moratorium, according to the IWC, was intended to be temporary. And, when, and we're just working out the details of how the harvest will resume. <clears throat> Scientific permit whaling is potentially one of the large loopholes in the moratorium. Uh, uh, under the convention, any government associated with IWC can um, basically write a permit to someone who wants to whale and uh, furthermore uh, decide how the proceeds are allocated. So nations can write their own permits and decide what to do with uh, the revenue. Um, as you may imagine, there is a lot of criticism of what's referred to as scientific whaling. Um, one, one criticism is that uh, the whale meat that's, that's taken for scientific research makes its way into the marketplace. Um, so there, there's a lot of revenue and profit generated uh, from this. Some argue that it's not, necessarily, not necessary to kill whales to study them. There are other uh, ways of researching whales that, that don't involve killing them. And when you look in the literature at what kind of um, publications and, and peer-reviewed literature has been published from these studies uh, using scientific whaling, there are very few references um, out there. Or there, there's very little defensible science in the literature. Um, and so the argument has been made that the scant results don't justify the, the level of scientific whaling that is currently happening. And this is the, uh, a rough, um, some rough figures of the current whaling situation. Currently, um, uh, whaling occur, uh, there are three nations who take whales, Norway, Japan, and Iceland. Japan takes whales under scientific permit. Uh, Norway and Japan are not bound by the moratorium because they formally objected. So they said, uh, we object, we're going to do what we want. So this is, you know, approximately 1,500 whales are taken every year. <clears throat> From a population biology standpoint, many of these whale populations, especially 
southern hemisphere minke whales, the population is large enough to sustain, sustain a hunt. Um, on the other hand, there are still several whale populations that have been depleted to a small fraction of their historical abundance in some populations. For example, uh, North Pacific right whales are really on the brink of extinction. <clears throat> so this brings up the question, can we sustainably harvest whales? Is it possible? There are two perspectives. No. Uh, they were all, all of the whale stocks were historically depleted. One example, the Atlantic gray whale was actually hunted to extinction. There used to be gray whales in the Atlantic, and there are no more Atlantic gray whales because we overexploited them. Um, in modern industrial whaling, there has been a lot of documentation of uh, falsification in logbooks in, in two forms. One is uh, underreporting by, say, a tenth of what was actually taken. And another is reporting, um, say, taking minke whales when you're actually taking endangered blue whales. Um, so so that, those are some of the criticisms that, OK, if we allow, you know, use our population biology principles and say this fraction of the minkies can be taken and that's sustainable, um, we have these other problems with, with enforcement that, that make it not impossible to sustainably whale. Furthermore, there's the perception that it's morally wrong. Why should we take whale? There are plenty of other things to eat. On the yes side, uh, since we, the, the moratorium has been established, many whale populations have been recovered. Um, there are uh, still uh, all large whales except for the gray whale, eastern North Pacific gray whale, are protected under the Endangered Species Act. Many have actually shown um, extensive enough recovery that uh, they may be delisted. They, they seem to be doing well. So why not? Why should we treat them as something special? Um, having some regulation to the harvest is better than unregulated scientific whaling. Scientific whaling, that you could just say, this is what I'm doing, allocate your own permit, and do whatever you want. So why not try to use some biology and say, this is what is sustainable if you're going to do it? Furthermore, um, it's possible to require some kind of observer program on the whaling ships so that this falsification can't happen. And um, finally, uh, whaling is part of the cultural heritage uh, for many, um, many nations. OK, so now I want to switch gears or continue and talk about uh, some work that I did as a scientific advisor to the International Whaling Commission. This was collaborative with a couple of folks, um, uh, Mark Zacharias and David Hirenbach. Um, we were commissioned by the IWC, and our task was to review the efficacy of the Southern Ocean Sanctuary and to evaluate the extent to which um, marine reserve theory could be could inform the way we're, uh, the efficacy, can inform the efficacy of the Southern Ocean Sanctuary and generally the IWC sanctuary program. <clears throat> what we told them after we reviewed this um, issue is that there was very little ecological basis to uh, the sanctuary program. Um, there were not very clear goals and so without clear goals, it was difficult to assess progress or to the extent to which goals were met um, with uh, monitoring data. We came up with a set of seven recommendations. Uh, most, uh, first, the, that the, um, there should be a, a clear purpose to the Southern Ocean Sanctuary. Is it uh, maintaining sustainable populations of whales? Is it biodiversity preservation? Is it maximizing fishery yield? That wasn't clear. Um, and then based on those goals, what are the measurable ob objectives? Um, this could have to do with what's a, a threshold level for probability of extinction or um, a, a lower bound of an estimate for stock size. <clears throat> These types of 
um, objectives and goals should be built into a sanctuary management plan that clearly lays out what kind of research and inventory is necessary to obtain data to assess these goals. Um, and so the monitoring data that would be collected in this assessment program um, could, could allow us to assess the extent to which goals were being met. And in the spirit of adaptive management, we proposed that, or we suggested that this management plan should be continually refined as new data become available and um, as we assess our objectives in this management framework. <clears throat> to our surprise, um, <laughs> we found that there was um, little desire to embrace ecological principles in making these decisions, in, in managing the Southern Ocean Sanctuary. There were two interpretations of our work. First, the pro-whaling nations, uh, they loved it. They said, oh, well, it sounds like you're saying that the sanctuaries are a bad idea. Um, let's just get rid of them all together. At the same time, they were recruiting developing countries um, to join the IWC to vote with them. So we would be in, in the meeting making some recommendations, uh, giving all of the scientific basis for the recommendations, and having these discussions with uh, representatives, say, from the Caribbean, who it was sort of a twilight zone discussion with, uh, well, well, here are the data. Here's why I think this. Well, no, I don't. I won't agree. And I, I didn't realize till later that this person, her trip to the meeting was paid by um, the Japanese, and um, she was being paid to vote a certain way. So there's no way to have a logical conversation. Um, on the other hand, the anti-whaling nations uh, were advocating the use of um, sanctuaries as a, a means to exclude whaling in advance of the resumption of whaling under the RMP. So they just wanted uh, the sanctuary to be in place with no whaling, uh, and there's no negotiating. Where, where, where are we now? Where, where were we left after this assessment? Well, we spent a lot of time doing the review. We concluded that the sanctuaries were not effective, um, that the scientific whaling that was happening continue, contributed very little to science, at the same time, there was uh, illegal, unregulated, and unreported whaling happening in addition to the scientific whaling. And the pro-whaling nations uh, vowed to leave the, R R leave the IWC altogether if the RMP or the quota base system was not accepted. So what we decided to do in, in the context of our, our role as scientific advisors we were only asked to comment specifically on the sanctuary program, but we had a lot more to say in terms of general recommendations. So we decided to write a paper about this and get it out into the peer-reviewed literature. And, um, and I'll tell you what, what happened with this. Um, first of all, we used some simple population models to illustrate some of these recommendations and to say, okay, you know, perhaps you think that we shouldn't whale and you think we should, but let's just look at the data and use some simple models to address this. Um, and what we did was we developed a, a two-patch matrix population model. So we have movement occurring between the, uh, the sanctuary and the unprotected area. And this is a schematic showing uh, that those movements. So we have inside the sanctuary and outside the sanctuary. Um, and there are uh, three life stages with transition probabilities with, within each. Um, and there's a uh, potential for movement. So adults can migrate inside and outside of the sanctuary, and recruitment can happen. So uh, young of the year that are produced by adults outside of the sanctuary can recruit to the sanctuary and vice versa. What we did with this model was compare the efficacy of the two management strategies. One, the RMS, the harvest-based uh, system. Um, and in this scenario, we reduced mortality by 10%. And we compared this to the sanctuaries where 
uh, mortality was re reduced by 20% just at one site. So it's the same mortal it's the same uh, change in mortality, but a different spatial arrangement of that. So the RMS, it was divided across the two patches, and the sanctuaries, it was just for the sanctuary. Okay, and what did we find? Well, the first thing that we, we uh, looked at was the sanctuary efficacy is measured by the change, the increase in the population growth rate um, for a range of assumptions about dispersal from the sanctuary. And that means how, to what extent do whales migrate in and out. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty about that. Um, but most of the whales we're talking about are known to be migratory. So we think that you know, it's, it's probably in the higher range over here uh, of where, where reality falls. So we compared that, the efficacy to the uh, efficacy of the RMS. So what we found was that if dispersal is uh, greater than uh, approximately 50%, the RMS is more effective as a management strategy. Um, if you look at this scale, it's tiny. The, the changes in the population growth rate are really small. Um, so we thought, well, let's, let's think about what that means in terms of a change in abundance in 100 years. And so we, we, we simulated using just a simple exponential population model um, what this would look like for a range of different population growth rates. Uh, and, and what we found was that the, so the RMS uh, are the red symbols. And if there is high dispersal, um, we have the, uh, this is indicated by the purple symbols, and the, the RMS, or sorry, the sanctuary is no dispersal. So given that we know that there, it's likely to, uh, whales are likely to move a lot, um, this, this suggests that the difference for, for higher population, for increasing populations of whales, this uh, is a significant difference in estimated abundance in 100 years. So even though it's a very small change in population growth rate, that translates to a big difference in terms of the total abundance of whales. OK, so the conclusion of this, um, of this, this work, the sort of more general conclusion, was that we should, first of all, get rid of scientific whaling, and second, um, think more critically about the interaction or the, the, the extent to which the sanctuary and the RMP um, can work together to effectively conserve whales. And this might mean applying the RMS, the quota-based system, with a system of sanctuaries that are, is designed to protect whales during certain critical life stages. <clears throat> and what was the impact of these recommendations? We hope that putting a paper out in the literature might um, bring more attention to our recommendations. Uh, when we were at the IWC meeting, we had the sense that there were a lot of polite nods, but really no intent to um, incorporate our suggestions. Um, the, similar to, to the results uh, at the IWC meeting, the pro-whaling nations um, use this to propose uh, to remove this. They, they actually made a proposal and said, let's get rid of the sanctuary altogether. They didn't receive the 75% majority, so that didn't happen. Um, the environmental groups didn't like us. They were not happy with us because they interpreted this as a threat to the sanctuary program. Um, but sort of on a more positive note, the general recommendations that we made were embraced by IWC in developing future um, sanctuary proposals. So the uh, South Atlantic Sanctuary proposal that's in the works now incorporates many of the suggestions that we made. So there is hope, um, but there really is in terms of IWC and many other policy settings, the change is not dramatic, you know, immediate. It's, there are very small steps in, in changes, uh, changing policy. Um, <clears throat> so to our surprise, this led to another independent assessment, which is what I want to talk about next. 
Uh, this was actually uh, commissioned by the Pew Charitable Trust in response to uh, the, the, the claim that was being made by pro-whaling nations that whales deplete fisheries and we should therefore cull whales. Um, it may not make sense, um, but it's an issue that comes up repeatedly at the IWC meetings and is really a heated debate with really very little information, very little scientific information. This is a quote from uh, one of the declarations from uh, the Caribbean that scientific research shows that whales consume huge quantities of fish so that this is an a, a matter of food security. So we need, to, we need to get rid of the whales because, you know, we need food for people. This is the, this is the, uh, the claim. <clears throat> so what, what, where did this come from? What's the basis for the claim? Well, as you know, I'm sure you've seen this slide. Well, perhaps you've seen this slide. And this is just showing um, the, the global collapse of fish stocks and how we've fished down the food web over, over time. Um, the argument is made that at the same time, many marine mammal populations like the North Atlantic harp seal is increasing. So, okay, it must be the marine mammals that are depleting the fish, is the argument. But, as you see, a lot of the whales are a small fraction of their historical abundance, so the argument doesn't apply across the board to, uh, for marine mammals. So the question of whose fault it is, um, whales are the culprits is on one side. On the other, is it possibly overfishing? Um, <clears throat> the argument about whales depleting fisheries, uh, whales eat fish, and so do people. So if we remove whales, <clears throat> there'll be more fish. So that's the, the simple logic for this argument. Um, but as you know, marine mammals are part of a marine ecosystem. And so we can't just simp uh, consider it, uh, these in impacts in such a simple form. So we need to c consider also these indirect impacts between different um, parts of the food web. So expanding on the simple schematic, if we add um, another, another trophic le level or another species to this food web, and this is again a schematic of cephalopods that consume the small fish, and we uh, implement um, our policy of reducing the abundance of whales, then we see more cephalopods, but that reduces the abundance of small fish, which are consumed by the lar large fish that people like. So in this case, there would be fewer fish for people as opposed to more fish. So Using, when you consider the ecosystem, which is more likely? Um, there really wasn't much scientific input to this. So our job was to uh, assess the available data and provide some scientific input. Um, what we did was uh, develop ecosystem models um, and use these models to examine the impacts of removing whales on the ecosystem and to ask questions like, well, how much consumption would be needed uh, to w see an impact on fisheries? Um, we also uh, sought to apply these models to identify what are the data needs to explore this question. And finally, to go to those uh, local communities, local um, developing countries that were being supported by pro-whaling nations to vote with uh, at, at the IWC meetings to engage them, show them the data, and talk about the implications of, of whaling in their, in their countries. Our study areas were tropical breeding areas, the, uh, the Caribbean, Northwest Africa, and the South Pacific. The most, now these areas were selected for political reasons because these are areas that are uh, the target of, of campaigns to engage with pro-whaling nations. So there's a lot of financial support given by Japan to these areas for developing fisheries. But from a biological standpoint, um, these aren't really that, these areas are not so important in terms of feeding for whales. So a priori, 
we didn't really expect there to be much of an impact because this is an example for minke whales. In, in these habitats, minke whales feed in northern latitudes and migrate down to these southern habitats for breeding. They're generally not known to, to feed. So if they're not feeding, how can they have an impact on the ecosystem? Nonetheless, we still sought to um, uh, examine this question and also to explore, you know, there, there's anecdotal evidence out there in the literature that uh, suggests that, you know, they, that, that sometimes you see feeding in the breeding area. So we could explore that with our model, um, doing some sensitivity analyses. So how did we go about this? Well, first we did an extensive literature review to parameterize the models. Um, and this was not a trivial effort. In fact, I had a technician working on this, gathering data for two years. So it wasn't just a, you know, go out and get the data and plug it in. It was quite extensive. We built models and um, most importantly, used these models to assess uncertainty. Um, I, myself, before engaging in this, was a bit skeptical of, of ecosystem models because they require so, met, so much information that we don't have. But there are ways for, uh, of, of testing these models and testing the performance of, of the models. One is to fit the models to independent time series data. And um, the other is, the other approach that we took is we, once we had some initial models constructed, went out into the local communities and said, here's what we found. Does it make sense? What are we missing? Do you have any more data that we could include? Um, then we used the models to investigate the role of whales in the ecosystem. And importantly, rather than what scientists typically do, you publish the paper and then go on to your next research project, we um, wanted to engage in the policy process by disseminating our results in um, key fora, specifically the International Whaling Commission. So it, the approach that we took was, I like to refer to as a global approach with regional participation. Uh, we held workshops in our, these are just images of a couple of the workshops. Um, <clears throat> and the, the people who were invited were lo largely local fishery managers, uh, a few who um, were actually, had received some financial support from the Japanese, and also local researchers who had insight and data um, associated with this, this study system. The modeling uh, framework that we used it was EcoPath with EcoSim. We use this as an uh, exploratory tool to ask, um, well, what if we increase fishing pressure? Um, actually, on the contrary, what if we imp impose a fishing moratorium? Um, what if we remove whales? What are the impacts? So once we got the model set up, we could use this as a is a framework for exploring these what-if questions. But the first thing we did was try to assess the model performance. Um, and this is an example of, of one way of doing this. It's looking at, so this, this figure is showing the biomass um, over time. Uh, and the data points are for crustaceans, but we actually did this for multiple um, trophic groups for which we could obtain in these independent data. And then the, the, the line is actually the model. So what this shows is that we can actually tune the model to fit the data, and that changes the whole structure of the, the food web. So the other thing that this is showing is that um, it's showing what happens so the blue line, which is you can't see for most of the figure, um, is showing the biomass of crustaceans with whales. Um, if we then remove baling whales and then remove cetaceans altogether, what kind of impact does that make? And you see here that uh, there's very little impact. The lines are almost completely overlapping. So, so that's one way of exploring um, how well our model fits the data, and actually tuning the model to independent time series data. We then, once we felt comfortable with, with this model, um, we then can look at 
uh, make some comparisons um, of what is being taken by fisheries and by whales. And the two things I want to point out here, first, uh, so the, the blue bars are fish, fishery catches, uh, the neon green uh, bars are cetacean consumption. And the two things I want to point out is that, uh, first, they're really eating different things. So the whales are eating krill, zooplankton, largely. These are baleen whales. And um, the fishery is taking things that are larger on the food web, larger, larger species like uh, clupeids. Um, so first of all, they're taking different things. And in general, there's more biomass taken out by fisheries than whales. We can then uh, use the model to simulate the removal of whales and see what would happen. And this is arbitrarily looking at what would happen after 20 years um, it, for different trophic groups. So as you see, there's virtually no impact for uh, most trophic groups, a tiny impact of about 2% for Sardinellus. We, th we, we wanted to explore uncertainty because, again, these ecosystem models require a lot of information for which we have a lot of uncertainty. Um, and so we wanted to validate these models with real data to the maximum extent possible, as I showed with the crustacean example. And then also to do some sensitivity analyses based on extreme assumptions. Um, for example, uh, we made the assumption that uh, that whales eat a fraction of what they normally consume in their feeding areas, what if we increase this amount? What if they actually are consuming a lot of uh, food in these breeding areas? What if we significantly underestimated the whale abundance? Um, or what if the fish biomass was overestimated? Or, or what if whales are eating different things than we thought they were? What if they're eating bigger species that, that humans like to consume that are also the target of fisheries. So we can use the model to explore the effect of these assumptions on our conclusions. And so this shows <clears throat> the predicted impact of whales compared to fishing um, in increasing the biomass of commercially available fish stocks. What this figure shows is on the, the left side of the panel, it's showing the impact of whales for three scenarios. One is assuming our best estimate of whale abundance and feeding. Uh, this is the impact on, we see a, a negligible impact on fish biomass. If we assume that we're actually underestimated um, whale feeding by 5 and 10 percent, doesn't really change. There's very little impact on the biomass of commercially available fish. Uh, this is the same, uh, consistent for two of our study regions. Um, and, um, oh, and on the contrary, if we then compare, um, <clears throat> compare the effect of removing whales to the effect of removing fishing, we saw a dramatic difference. In fact, uh, for our best estimate of fishing rate, if we remove fishing, we saw a 450% increase. If we assume that we were underestimating the rate of fishing by 1.5 and 2%, we saw even more remarkable increases in the biomass of fish. So if you stop fishing, there'll be more fish. Um, so we put that out there in the literature just to sort of make the point that uh, it's not really the whales that are depleting the fish resources, it's the fisheries. <clears throat> our, our conclusions were that like I said, to sort of summarize, great whales eat many fewer fish than whales take. They eat different prey. And they don't appear to compete in these tropical areas through direct or indirect uh, interactions. So here is the set of recommendations that we put out in, in the paper um, that pointing the finger at whales um, really should be considered in a larger context. There are a lot of other things happening in these tropical areas. Foreign fleets overexploiting offshore resources, ecosystem collapses, and of course climate change. One thing that's not considered that we had a lot of conversations with the local communities is that a lot of people go, travel to these areas to, 
to view whale, whales. So a, a live whale may be worth more than a dead whale. And, and these sort of indirect social and economic benefits also need to be taken into account. Science should be central to the discussions about managing whale and fishery arguments. And I think one of the really interesting things that we learned is that the arguments are being made um, for reasons related to fishery sector aid from pro-whaling nations. And in fact, people would openly say, well, I don't really think this, but I'm being paid to vote this way. Um, so that was quite interesting. Um, and finally, the, the basis for the argument that whales deplete fish and we should manage, manage this, these whales it was couched in the context of ecosystem-based management. And I don't think ecosystem-based management should uh, seek to modify particular trophic levels to maximize fishery yield, but the goal of EBM is to manage for long-term sustainability. So those were our general recommendations. What was the impact of this work? Um, there's good news and bad news. Some of the kind of funny interesting good news is that after we published the paper, uh, the pro-whaling nation said, well, we never said that. <laughs> and so we th thought, OK, our job is done. <laughs> Great, you never said that. Um, and what this has led to, I think, is uh, potentially a, a, the potential transition from um, having this vote buying occurring to actually focusing on the real issues in these tropical nations. Um, Overexploitation by distant water fleets, climate change. Um, one study developed in one of our workshops on the ecosystem service value of, of whaling in Dominica. In fact, Dominica um, changed their vote with IWC. They had been voting pro-whaling, and they, they, they reversed that. So that was quite rewarding. However, when we went to the ecosystem modeling subgroup and presented our models, this is the best information, we tested the sensitivity, et cetera. In the report, and it was distributed to everyone at the meeting, and there's a statement in there that wasn't even, didn't come up in the discussion, but the statement was, modeling can't be used to predict interactions between whales and fisheries. So in a sense, it dismisses everything we did. And honestly, I have no idea why the, the ecosystem modeling um, subgroup asserts this. Um, my sense is that it's because of a distrust of models, that there's a lot of uncertainty and therefore we can't really make predictions. I think there are ways of tackling that. One way is by doing some model comparisons, comparing different ecosystem models and looking at how they perform for different indicators. So if your indicator is fishery yield or a certain population size or extinction risk, um, how would different models perform? I think that would be a really useful exercise. However, or more broadly, I, I think all of this uh, work as a scientist and trying to get it into policy um, needs to be considered in this broader context of what is the future of the International Whaling Commission. These are some of the big obstacles in um, science-based management. And I love this quote, it's perfect. The perfect is the enemy of the good. And I think this, this characterizes the, the NGO community insisting that, or, or unwilling to compromise um, on whaling. That the only thing that they will agree to is absolutely no whaling under any circumstances, rather than allowing some limited quota that may be sustainable. As a result, there's no compromise, and the, the, the whaling nations continue to whale um, unsustainably. So this, this year, at the International Whaling Commission meeting, there was a, a deal which referred to as a compromise proposal that um, made a lot of compromises on each side. One was to phase out whaling in sanctuaries and adopt the RMP, but also allow coastal whale, whaling in, uh, in Japan. Um, but this failed. And it failed largely because of the unwillingness of Japan and, and the NGOs to budge. So where does this leave us? Um, I think one question that, I think the big question for, for me is, well, will there be uh, an attempt for another compromise agreement next year? 
And my sense is that probably not. A lot went into developing this compromise proposal that was proposed this year, and there was a lot of hope and a lot of optimism. And I think um, at this stage, it, there's a lot of uncertainty about the future of the International Whaling Commission as a, 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 man, a management body. Um, I think there's time will tell whether uh, the NGOs can convince the pro-whaling nations to change their culture and stop whaling. Like I mentioned, I think this is a little bit of a risky strategy because right now, unsustainable whaling is happening. Um, and I think an intermediate goal might be to try to foster some agreement to sustainably whale rather than insisting no whaling and then reaching a stalemate. We've been stuck in a stalemate for years. Um, furthermore, if this unsustainable whaling continues, once the population stocks are depleted, they may not recover. So we may see the same thing happen to um, the North Atlantic gray, uh, gray whale. Um, so one, one possible uh, solution or possibility that the NGOs are advocating is the use of trade sanctions. But um, my sense is that this may not fare well in the world court. The reason is, is that under the IWC, first of all, it's a voluntary um, organization and the pro-whaling nations aren't doing anything illegal. They, they objected and they're doing scientific whaling and so there's nothing, so it's legal to trade under CITES. Um, so I'm not sure how well that would work but it is something that is being discussed. Okay, so now that I have you all really depressed about the situation, I want to sort of comment on what we can learn from this uh, situation and how it can be applied to both national and international policy science um, situations. So one thing I think that's really interesting and, and important to to think about as scientists and getting our science into policy is that when there isn't scientific, cons scientific consensus and when there's a lot of scientific uncertainty, other things enter the decision process, politics, emotions. So I think as scientists, we need to come together and agree and provide um, uh, clear input, clear scientific input. Um, one, one approach to doing this is the use of simple uh, models, ecological models, to bring science into the discussion. And, you know, people may place different values on different species that, that th those values are not scientific, they're arbitrary, like we may think that large whales um, are, are more important than dolphins. And, okay, let's incorporate those values into our model. Th that's possible. It's possible to include values and in social and um, economic constraints in these models as well. I feel that um, there are unique challenges in international settings in bringing science into policy, and I think that the situation is, uh, I'm more optimistic about the situation in national policy settings, in my experience. Um, and in terms of priorities, I think one of the, the important priorities in finding common ground between uh, scientists and policy makers is developing n new approaches to communicate. A lot of the time there's just ineffective communication happening between scientists and policy makers where in this example the scientists are looking at the situation, the policy, and saying this really doesn't make any sense. Um, the, the way that whales are being managed um, doesn't uh, it is ineffective in meeting our management objectives. So the, the Voltaire quote, the perfect is the enemy of the good, we're going to adamantly say no whaling, um, which is perfect, and the good might be sustainable whaling. So we're undermining um, what we are, are seeking, per, our perfection. So on the other hand, the policymakers are able to use the science in justifying their policies. So how can we improve this communication? I think there's a lot of work to be done in that realm. Furthermore, <clears throat> I think as scientists who are committed to um, 
getting our science out into policy, we, it's not enough to just write papers. I think it's essential that we engage in the policy process, whether that be um, going to national or international meetings, serving on panels, recovery teams, um, or also bringing stakeholders into uh, the process as you're developing these models and soliciting feedback because the potential that these models will be embraced will be much higher if people have had input from these local communities. So these are the lessons that I've learned. Perhaps they would have some implications for other situations. Um, I would like to acknowledge all the funding for this work and I would be happy to take any questions. So your question, let me make sure I understand your question. Your question is um, about what, to what extent you were surprised that people just embraced our results and, and what about impacts in areas where they are feeding? Okay, good question. Um, there hasn't been a lot of research in northern latitudes where there, it's more likely that there is an interaction. Um, some, Norway, for example, has a, has a research group that's starting to look into that issue with minke whales in the North Atlantic. Personally, you know, there's nothing, there aren't studies that have been put out there, but I suspect that the message is going to be different. That in these northern latitudes um, where minkies and our, our minke whales are eating closer to the same food that we, we target, there may be an interaction. Those studies haven't been conducted, and once they do, I think that that, that information should enter the discussion. And it, you know, we need to look at it regionally as well. This was for tropical. I think I potentially didn't um, emphasize enough that our results apply to tropical breeding areas um, solely. And, but we were motivated based on the, um, the campaigns in those areas. So politically motivated science. That's a really interesting question. Um, the question was, is, do you think that we could reason with, with the, the folks who are being paid? And in fact, so the work that I did on the whaley fish issue was collaborative with the Pew Foundation. And we, we co-hosted the workshops in these developing nations. And I didn't talk about everything, but we, ha we actually had a series of workshops aimed at doing just that, bringing them in, trying to engage them in the scientific process. You know, he, here are the data from your area. Um, here's what the model suggests, you know, what are you thinking? What's your logic? And I, I don't feel like they completely turned around, but I feel like there is potential for that with continued efforts, um, collaborative efforts between us, the scientists, and Pew's, I think it's called Advancing Policy Solutions. Um, they're experts in, in this kind of environmental negotiation. So yes, I am optimistic about that. Thanks.